Thank you for attending the session, and we are going to get started on this session titled Turning an Idea into a Data-Driven Production System, an Energy Load Forecasting Case Study. So my name is uh, Lucas Garcia. I work as an application engineer at MathWorks. Uh, as you probably know already, MathWorks, we are the creators of MATLAB. Um, so before we start, maybe let's take some time to explain this very long title of today's talk. Um, so today we're going to see how to turn an idea into a prototype and then the prototype into a production system by leveraging models that purely rely on data. And then we're going to do so through um, a data analytics workflow for an energy load forecasting case study. So before we jump into more technical details, um, let me briefly explain on what we mean or what I mean by energy forecasting. So according to Wikipedia, Energy forecasting refers to any predictive modeling or uh, looking to the future of any aspect in the energy industry. That is um, a little bit vague, but it could refer to uh, loads, so the actual electricity demand. It could be electricity price. It could also be commodity pricing for fossil fuels. Or it could be electricity production, um, where its biggest interest today is in the area of renewable energy, especially solar and wind. So today we're going to focus in energy load forecasting, so this case study of today is on energy demand. So by now you're probably already familiar with data analytics, and um, so I want to basically bring, bring to the table some of the insights that, in my opinion, data analytics brings us. So we have descriptive analytics, so we can decide or we can look into the data and see what happened. We have diagnostics, so um, why this did happen. We also have um, predictive analytics, what will happen next, and then prescriptive analytics, what should be done. So our goal with these uh, data analytics is going to be turning large volume of complex data into actionable information, actionable insights for our uh, purposes. Um, so we can say that with data analytics, we're going to be using data to make better decisions um, and influence others. And here's the workflow that I'll be suggesting for the talk today. Uh, I'm going to start by looking into how to access and explore data. Then we'll look into how to pre-process that data, after which we'll develop some predictive models and we'll end up by integrating those models into much larger systems. So that being said, let's take a look into the case study of today. Um, all right, so what you're seeing here is uh, an application we built on, this is running on Amazon uh, EC2, and unfortunately, probably the URL is very small for you to, to type it in your mobile phones, but you, got, you could actually do it if you wanted. Um, so this is, this is running there on, on Amazon EC2, and what this particular tool allows me to do is to uh, we're, got, we're seeing here uh, Google Maps, and on top of Google Maps, we see uh, we have drawn different grids on the state of New York. These are energy grids. And these blue dots, or uh, red, uh, sorry, um, red dots represent the um, weather data that we have in this location. So we have weather stations across the state. So again, what this tool is going to allow me to do is just pick a particular grid and generate a forecast. So um, I get a forecast, and I also get some information on what happened in the previous 48 hours and what the prediction is going to be for the next 24 hours. So this application, uh, and by the way, if I choose a, a, different, um, a different grid, so for example, if I look into New York City, and I generate a forecast again, I'm going to see a very different set of behavior. Um, so we're going to have to see on how, how we should model this, uh, this data. OK, so what's going on um, when I hit this Generate Forecast button is that a series of MATLAB algorithms are running uh, on Amazon EC2 to um, basically extract all the relevant information that we want to use, so pull out all the data from different data sources. Then we're going to be cleaning the data, um, stitch it together, run it through a neural network model, and then show the results here on the screen. Now, um, 
this tool is all about meeting business needs. So if you're working for, for example, a, um, um, a power company or you're running the, the, power, um, the power grid of, of New York City, you probably would like to know at, on what level should you be running different power plants across the state. So should they be running at full operation or not? for the next 24 hours. And to do so, you very likely need a very good and accurate demand forecast. Also, um, if you, uh, you, you need to know this forecast since you probably need to buy energy from a neighboring grid at some point in time during the day. So um, apparently, we, we also do that here in Spain. So um, this is something relevant as for uh, business decision making. This is also a tool that we could put in the hands of a large number of group, uh, a large number of people, so a large organization, and make it available on demand, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, because really power plants never stop. So downtown downtime is, is really unacceptable here. And finally, it's also about openness. So we want to open this tool and make it available uh, for a larger crowd. Maybe. Um, so this is just uh, energy demand, but maybe you're interested in electricity pricing. And to develop a demo or to develop an application for electricity pricing, you're going to very likely need to do um, something similar and pull out similar data. And you will also be um, very likely using the prediction that, that we've uh, outputted here. So we've created this um, uh, RESTful web service with uh, two functions, uh, generate demand forecast and visualize demand forecast. And what this allows us to do is just to open the MATLAB analytics to anyone who wants to use it for another purposes. So um, we have these um, designed these different parameters that you can use. So you can output the data as text or JSON or HTML. And also, we've done the same thing for the graphs. So um, you can actually pull out the data and the graphs from, from this web, um, web service. Now, interestingly, if you're going to be developing an application for electricity pricing and you, 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 could, be, you could be really using this, uh, despite these are demand forecast predictions and visualizations, you might still want to use them for your own reports. So um, that's something we're, we're going to be interested in looking into. OK, so despite this is a... Um, an application that shows what the final product could look like. Uh, what I'll be focusing today is on what happens under the hood when I click this Generate Focus button. So what are the MATLAB analytics that are happening in there? So again, we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of someone who has to develop this day-ahead uh, energy load forecasting problem. And um, we're going to have to design an application that, that runs smoothly. Um, to do so, we're going to be acquiring some data, cleaning it up, uh, developing the predictive model, and then deploying it um, to production. And to do so, we're just going to hand it off to someone in, in IT who can deal with it better than, than we as data scientists can. So um, that being said, let me go to the, the MATLAB environment. And what I'm seeing here is, um, if you're not familiar with MATLAB, so this is the MATLAB desktop, and we have a live script running here. So um, I've opened a live script, which is similar to a notebook interface. Uh, you've probably seen those in other, in other programming environments, too. And what this allows us to do is to, in a single piece of, um, uh, in, a, in a single document, just basically have all the uh, code that we're going to be running together with all the um, information with, with regards to this, uh, to this example. So I've already done some work, and um, just right before the presentation, I decided it would be wise to download the historical data. Um, so I'm downloading here um, a full year of data, so year 2005 to 2006. Now, let me briefly uh, explain on uh, how the data is going to look like. And we're going to basically be using two data types, or two, uh, two data sources, excuse me. So one data source is going to be the uh, New York Independent System Operator data. So this is publicly available data. And the other data set is going to be the NOAA uh, weather data. So again, these are publicly available. You can, you can use them as well. And these are updated real time. So, so that being said, here uh, I'm going to start by downloading this historical data. And to make it fast and nice, what I've done is um, 
I'm using some, um, some MATLAB code, um, using WebSafe to, to save the results or to save the files on disk. And to speed things up, I'm using parallel for loops. So this is uh, basically a for loop that runs in parallel across the different threads in your computer so that we can speed up um, downloading. So I'm going to skip that for now because uh, it's not that interesting. And I unzip the files once I have them. Great. So next thing I'll be doing is I have to work with the files all together. And if, you, if you're creating this application from scratch, you probably have to look into the data. So let's look into uh, how the data look like. Um, so I'm going to open one of these examples. Uh, so one of these uh, data files. So these are all CSV files. And they come with different columns. So I have timestamps, time zones. I have the name of the grid. I have the ID that identifies the grid. And finally, I have the load, the historical load, and that particular timestamp. So there's, there's a nice, interesting thing about all these files. And, they are, and this is that they are structured. So they, they have a good structure. All files preserve the same structure. And because that is, um, that is true, I'm going to be able to use a MATLAB class called data store. I, I just have to point to the location where the files are. And if I run this, um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be pointing to those files which are stored in disk. Now, these files are stored in disk, but very well, they, they could be stored somewhere else, like uh, uh, Hadoop or other inf uh, infrastructure. So if I hit DS, which is the name of the object that I just created, I see that I'm going to be pointing to 300 and, well, these three plus 362, so a full year of data. I see information on the encoding of the variable, of the, of the, um, of the file. I see information on how to treat missing data and so on. And, I, and these are properties I can change very easily. Um, now, because I want to scan the data, I, I yet haven't done it, um, I'm, I'm going to be able to decide or to determine how data needs to be scanned. So timestamps, then we're going to have um, some strings, some categorical data, some integers, and then some floating point numbers for the loads. But as a matter of fact, I just want to read timestamps, name of the grid, and load. OK? So let's, let's run this section. And once I have that, this is already um, set up for me to read the whole, uh, the whole thing. So all I need to do is call the function read all. And this is going to be pulling the data into my workspace, into my MATLAB workspace. Uh, I'm going to be using RAM memory for that. So this is an in-memory operation. So when I do that, um, it's going to take a little while. Um, but I'm going to be pulling quite, quite some information from there. OK. Um, once it's done, I'll just give it some, some seconds to finish. Uh, I can take a look at what happens in the workspace. And you'll see that in the workspace, despite I've only used a year of data, I have over 1 million rows of observations, which is already quite a lot. So there are a few things I have to do to get going. So first, I'm going to be opening the, the data set uh, to take a look at it and see what we can do with it. So as you see here, let me give it, give it some room. Um, this is what we have. So we have different timestamps. And then uh, uh, beside timestamp, we have the name of the different grids, and then the loads. But you see that um, for every single timestamp, we have uh, all, already 11 rows okay, identifying the different grids. So ideally, what I would like to do is to pivot the data, if um, saying it in a nice and, and friendly way. So pivot the data and, and send the, the names of the grids to the columns so that I can have one timestamp per row, right? different timestamp per row. So the way to do that in the MATLAB language is using a function named unstack. Um, so that's what I'll be doing next. Um, excuse me. So I'm be, I'll be unstacking the data, and then I'll be just sorting data out. Um, so um, I'm just going to be sorting the dates so that the dates are in order. All right, so I'm running that. And hopefully, at some point, we'll see the results on screen. And there we go. We have it there. 
Uh, so now I have a single timestamp per row, and along the columns, I have the different grids. And we're going to see interesting things. So for example, if I click on the date column and one of the grids, so downward, and go to the plot tab and hit plot, I'm going to get this graph. And this is actually the graph of um, what the data, what the data says. And you might think um, that this data is correct, but in fact, in fact it's not. Um, so there's a lot of good data here, but there are a lot of uh, observations that are off the charts and that should be fixed before we start working um, with any machine learning algorithm. Otherwise, we're going to ruin it. And we see that there are also many, it, it happens many times where the demand goes to zero. If, if there's energy, anyone from the energy industry here, you know that it's impossible that the demand goes to zero. So uh, this has to be fixed in some way. All right, so that being said, um, I'm going to move on here, so I, I visualized that. Oh yeah, and by the way, there's, there's something also quite interesting in the data, and uh, I imagine that um, you, you all data scientists here and, and data analytics people, big data people know this, that when you start working with your own data or with data publicly available from, from somewhere, it happens that uh, it, it just doesn't work. So you need to dedicate a lot of time to clean the data, um, make it work as you wish. And here there's some interesting things, like we are going to have a um, um, timestamp by five minutes, and all of a sudden I get things like this, right? So either I'll fix these things, or probably the neural network model that I'm going to be implementing is going to totally fail. So I have to retime the whole data set. Okay? So what I'll be doing here next is um, I'm going to be converting the data to um, a class or an object called timetable that is able to deal with timestamps in a very natural way. Um, we will make sure if the, reg the data is regularly sampled, very likely we'll get a, a no here. Uh, we'll look at the distribution of the sampling rates, and then we will be retiming the whole data set to make sure that there is a five-minute interval in between observations. And the way we're doing that is through linear interpolation, so nothing fancy. We keep it simple for today. All right, excellent. So um, I'll run that. And we see, of course, data is not regularly sampled. The, um, the different, so the distribution of the sampling rates is here. So we have very different sampling rates. The median is over almost six, six minutes. And then we'll retime. So after retiming, what happens basically is that every timestamp is now regularly sampled. Okay, observations are good now. Okay, more things to fix. So we need to fix as well the fact that we have a lot of zeros here. Okay? And probably we also need to fix all the data that is spoiled there with um, probably a lot of outliers. So the way we're going to be doing that, again, is um, we're going to be finding the observations that are zero, and we're going to be filling the missing blanks. Um, again, using, in this case, linear interpolation. There are many other methods, but this makes it simple. So I run that, and it's going to go through all the observations and interpolate it linearly by the columns. OK, so all right, so we're going to see here how in line number two, this gets updated with num some of the data. OK? I'll now invite you to plot again. We see that this no longer goes to zero. These, are, these points are actually non-zero but we should also fix them, so. Excellent, so next thing is removing the spikes, removing the data that, is, um, that shouldn't be there. And again, multiple methods that we may use. Um, I'm gonna keep it to the basics on using a, a moving average with a one hour window. So um, this basically reduces itself to using um, move mean in MATLAB, and then doing a graph. All 
All right, so that's done here now. And if I open it and show it back here, we see that now the orange data is the data that we are going to be using. Okay? All the more powerful methods will allow for much better smoothing techniques. But with the time we have uh, for this talk, I think that, that that should be enough. Great. So we're going to move on. Um, next thing I'll be doing is I have to do the same thing for the weather data. So I've been doing all this thing for the load, uh, the energy load, but I have to do the same thing for the uh, weather data. Now, um, for in the interest of time, um, I'm, I'm going to be doing a reduced version of this, because if I run this section of the code, you're going to be seeing that the whole data set is almost 50 gigabytes, or over 50 gigabytes in size. So altogether, uh, load data plus weather data is roughly around 60 to 70 gigabytes of memory. So in order to work it nicely with this computer, since I, I'm, not, I'm not using uh, Hadoop or any other technology uh, at the moment, I'm going to be doing that with a small and reduced version of the weather data set, um, which is going to be um, 1.72 gigabytes, which is already good enough. Um, so that I total this space disk, I'm using the same data store container. So that's, that's exactly the same thing. Okay, and there's an interesting part because uh, all these weather stations are weather stations from different places, and I'm only interested in the weather stations in, uh, in New York City. I am going to have to filter some of those uh, data points. So I'm going to create a table that shows exactly the IDs of the weather stations I want to use. All right, so. Let's finish it up by looking into tall data. OK, so um, we have designed in MATLAB a way to handle and process big data. And that is by using these data store objects together with um, the tall arrays. So tall arrays are, is data that is very tall and very narrow. Okay. And these data can come from uh, actually um, other infrastructures. It doesn't have to be necessarily uh, on my desktop. So I can use data that is available on HDFS, for example. So um, the way this is going to work is that these uh, tall data can seamlessly spill data over to disk if needed. All right. Um, so what, what this is going to allow us to do is that we're going to be able to use in MATLAB data that is as large as we want because we'll be using out-of-memory data. And we can even leverage um, our, own, um, our own cores in our computer. We can leverage the fact that we may have access to a Hadoop or a Spark cluster, or even a traditional cluster. All right, so I'm going to run this section of the code, and then move back to the slides. So um, these data, once I run this tall, um, this tall instruction, this is, gonna, uh, this is not going to trigger data yet, or trigger processing yet. Only when I gather results, this is going to happen. So here you see the reasoning why this is going to work well with Spike. So with that, I'm going to be running this in MATLAB. And I'm going to come back for the slides. All right, so let me go again to the data analytics workflow um, for a second. And basically, we started by accessing and exploring data. Then we're going to be pre-processing um, pre the data as we've done, after which we do this develop of prediction, predictive models, and then we integrate it with the analytics systems. So what we've seen so far is this step going from accessing to pre-processing. And I have not said it before, but there's some challenges that you may face when doing this. And 
really your data can come from multiple sources. Uh, you might be dealing with business and transactional data, so SQL, NoSQL databases, maybe text, maybe spreadsheets, maybe the data is coming from uh, web sources, JSON objects, but you may also have engineering data. So data coming from images, audio, GPS locations, sensors. And here the challenges are quite large. So you, you may have to aggregate data and look into how the data has to be aggregated, clean the data, do specific processing, and deal with out-of-memory data. So basically our, our pitch at, in MATLAB is that by using um, the fact that uh, MATLAB cannot only handle uh, transactional data, but also engineering data, you're going to be able to empower your analytics which mu with much better results. All right, so next step is going from um, pre-processing to developing these predictive models. And basically, to do so, we also encounter some, sa some challenges. Um, uh, believe me when I say this, that today there's a still a lack of data analytics expertise out there. Um, so this forum, uh, Big Data Spain, might not might say the opposite thing, but um, there, there's still a lot of um, unknown on, on data science. And people ask, well, how to best transform the data to represent it, um, how to select features uh, in, a, in a nice way, which models uh, do the best representation on the data. All right, so back into the MATLAB language. Um, this filtering out of the data took um, roughly 1.6 minutes, and we can move on. So what I've done here is, I, I, I sh what I should be doing next is filtering out all the zeros in the weather data, filtering out all the noise, but uh, in the interest of time, what I've done is um, I'm loading some, um, some uh, MAT files that I've already saved, so this is where the data is and I'm going to be using that instead. Um, next thing is, uh, I have these, again, these New York um, data. Now I'm working with a full data set, so this is starting in 2007, and it's going all down to 2000, 2006, February 2006. And I have the same thing for the weather data. And one interesting thing that I need to do to do a predictive model is to sync the data together. So I'm going to be doing a join of the two data sets using Synchronize. And Synchronize, what it does, it's basically a join, um, but for timestamps. OK, so it's a very um, well-established uh, way to, to do, um, to do uh, times times joining. So I'm going to do that. And then we're going to be forecasting only one grid. So I'm going to focus on the, um, the New York City grid uh, instead of focusing on all the 11 grids that are there. So I'm going to be developing a predictive model for New York City only. And we'll have to replicate what I'm going to be doing here for other grids. So what I do here basically is just extract from the data all, all the things I need to, to deal with New York City, so the loads and the weather stations and I'm going to be creating some predictors. So if you have to develop a predictive model for energy load forecasting, you have to think about what predictors you should be doing or you should be using. So things like hour, things like the day of the week, things like is this a weekend or not? Do you, use, do you put the washing machine on a weekend or not? So these, these, these things are going to make an impact, right? So um, we're going to be designing that. So we're going to be using the load, the month, the year, day of the week, whether it's a weekend or not. Uh, of course, we have to use the temperature or the dew point, um, because this is, com this is information coming from the weather station. And also, when performing time series analysis, you'll be using lagged predictors. So what, what happened a couple of hours in the past, or what happened a couple of days in the past? And you have to determine what the best predictors are, what the best lagged predictors. Should I, should I use the load? from, uh, I don't know, two, two days ago or from three days ago for the forecast? What's the best use that we can, um, what's the best lag predictor that we can use? So here what we're doing is basically doing a correlation across the, the entire data set to find that out. 
And if I uh, run this section to compute this correlation, what I'm going to get, I'm going to open this up, and by zooming in here, okay, here, this is the correlation, and I see that the highest peaks are here. That's the hour 24. I'm not sure if it's, uh, you can see it from the back, so that's one day before, and this is the other peak, 168, that's seven days ago. So those are the lag predictors that make sense to use. All right, so um, that being said, I'm going to prepare the data. And then what I'm going to be doing is, as with any predictive model, I have to make sure that my data works whenever I use a different data set. So I'm going to split the data into training and testing. Um, and you can also do things like cross-validation, but I'll just keep it simple, as I said before. And I'm going to use the year 2012 for testing. So I'm going to basically split that, that data set into training and test. And my next thing is to um, create a neural network. I said I was going to be using neural networks. So in MATLAB, you can use neural networks by using these apps. So I'm going to be using neural net fitting. And what these apps allow me to do is, through a point-and-click interface, um, deal with the fact that um, you might not be familiar with neural networks. So I click Next here. I'm going to enter the inputs and the targets. My observations are set by rows, so hit Next. This is how I'm going to split the data and training, validation, and testing for the, uh, to avoid the overfitting of the neural network. I hit Next. That's where the magic happens. So this is the number of hidden neurons. So I have to put a number here. Now, if you're familiar with neural networks, you, you'll probably know already what you have to put. If you don't, well, you just have to come up with something, and, and then we'll figure it out. But uh, I'm going to start by putting a number, 20. This number is basically going to represent roughly the degree of nonlinearity that the data has. Okay? So I have these 20 here. I click Next. Um, and then I'm going to just do the training. There are multiple training uh, algorithms to choose from, but I'll just go with the defaults. So here training begins, and it's going to iterate ac across many, many iterations, so it's going to go fast. But I can also look at the performance of the network. So if I hit here, I see what the um, validation performance is for the neural network. This is how the uh, training is, is, is going on. So uh, the mean square error is being reduced as we progress, and at some point the validation error will get higher, and that's, when, that's where we're going to stop. Otherwise, we're going to be doing overfitting. Great, so that's fine for now. So I'm going to stop the training. I don't need to do much more. Uh, I can look at the regression plot. So here I'm looking into how the targets compare to the output, and I can see that these numbers are extremely good already. So, so I'm quite confident that this model could, could actually do a, a good work in the, in, in the real world. So I'm going to hit Next. Here I have some options to evaluate the network. I'm going to skip those. I can deploy the solution to other architectures. I'm going to skip that for now. And I'm going to save my results to MATLAB. Okay, so I save my results in a net object. I save them. And actually, I can also look at this script. So I can look into what code should I, f should I have to write in the first place if I was doing this by hand. Okay, so I'm going to leverage that. As a matter of fact, m most of those lines that I have there, I have them right here. Okay, um, and even I can use parallel computing to speed things up. I could even use a cluster if I have access to a cluster. Okay, so the next thing is to see how this performs. So to do so, I'm going to be evaluating the um, Mean absolute percent error, uh, that's a common practice in energy forecasting, and show the results both for the neural network, for the training and the test set. Um, so when I run that, I see that the error is roughly 2%, even the test error is very low. So 
these results uh, will open the eyes of anyone in the energy industry who, uh, who won't do this, because um, they are extremely, extremely good. Um, now, what else can I do? I can look into... I, remember, I, I left out the two, year 2012, so I'm going to use that year 2012 to look at the graph. Um, so if I run the section of the code, and I open up the, the MATLAB graph that comes out, I'm going to be seeing the performance of the network. So what you're seeing here is how the network performs. Um, in blue, you can see the performance of the neural network, and in orange, you can see the real measurement, because we had this data available, so we can use that and compare them. Um, I, it's funny, when I, when I was preparing this, um, I, there were some things going on that were a little bit off, off the charts, and there was this particular one, so I'm going to zoom in here. So if you look at this, there's something weird that happened on October 29, um, 2012. So what I did is, okay, let's just Google that. Um, so what happened on October 29, 2012, so what happened is that Hurricane Sandy hit New York City. Uh, so we're not modeling the fact that we, we could have a hurricane um, in, in New York City. So that's not being considered in the model. Um, so to do that, we, we could certainly do it, but we could add a lot of more complexity to the problem. Uh, now, however, this is a forecast that works very well for normal operation conditions. All right, so let me go back here. Um, so again, by using apps, you can go seamlessly from the point-and-click interface to the code, which makes it a lot easier to do data science. Okay, and the final step, I think I'm almost done uh, with that, is to integrate the analytics into larger systems. So again, some challenges may arise here, because um, the end user of this application is not going to be a scientist, it's not going to be somebody technical, it's going to be some sort of operator, analyst, but, or a customer, or some staff. There are different targets that you might have to deal with, so cluster environments, uh, you might want to deploy this to the web, you might want to integrate it with Python language or Java or any of the, um, um, of the cluster infrastructures that we are seeing at the conference today. So, how we can do that? Basically, with MATLAB, you can just bring your whole application into different enterprise systems. So, we can integrate with, again, standalone executables, Hadoop, Spark, languages like C, C++, Python, Java, .NET, and MATLAB production server, which is basically a server that runs with multiple headless MATLAB so that you can um, basically uh, allow people to concurrently use your application. And the other thing that you can also do is um, you can offload or you can um, bring an algorithm, a particular algorithm, and generate code, C code, or HDL code, or PLC code. This is portable code that can run in embedded devices. So for example, in one of your phones. So you can have MATLAB analytics running in your phones. Um, so that's, that's also something quite unique. So really, your MATLAB analytics can run anywhere, both in engineering and enterprise systems, uh, and also in, uh, yeah, in embedded hardware. So just for those who are curious, uh, this is um, what, what's going under the hood in, in Amazon EC2. So we have uh, Apache Tomcat doing the web service, and we have MATLAB production server running simultaneous MATLAB uh, runtimes so that we can we're, we're able to handle multiple requests from different users. Um, some key takeaways. So with MATLAB, you can basically use your business data and your engineering data, so you leverage all, all the information you have. MATLAB enables you as um, data science experts to do data science. And basically, MATLAB analytics run anywhere, both in uh, embedded devices and enterprise systems. Okay, so with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference. So, any questions? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Lucas, for your nice uh, presentation. I uh, just wanted to ask you, that: uh, have you ever done any kind of analysis to do any kind of predictive modeling based on Spanish markets? Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Based on, in, in, in Spain, I mean, for a Spanish electricity market, have you done any kind of analysis? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so unfortunately, this is not something we can disclose. Um, but, but the truth is that there are many um, electricity companies worldwide and in Europe and in Spain using MATLAB. So the short answer to your question is yes. Um, there are MATLAB users across different companies um, here locally in Spain. Okay, you know what I'm asking? Because uh, we here in our company, which is Aries Innovation, uh, actually we have developed a, an application uh, which is we developed it to, to forecast, to do some predictions over the, the Spanish electricity market for the energy prices, the hourly prices. Right. Um, it's presented as a poster here, and, and we can come and we, we will actually, and right now I have the mobile application. Hmm. Uh, we are uh, we're using some official data, which, uh, which is presented each day for the next day, uh, actually to make predictions for the next 24 hours. All right. Cool. Yeah, so actually, we, we, so this example comes from um, a real case study from a customer. Of course, we're using publicly available data to make it available to a larger crowd. But yeah, um, so energy forecasting is a hot topic across yeah. energy companies. So yeah, we, we not just have a real case study, we have a real product here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And I'm really proud to say that because we actually, we got, for some days, we got to 1.8% uh, in the mean absolute percentage error. Yep, yep. But uh, in overall, the, the average error is in order about 4 or 5%. Yeah, so actually, I stopped the training too early. If, if I had moved on with the training, uh, maybe for um, yeah, we used a thousand actually, iterations. We used five, five, five years at least. I mean, the, the hourly data for five years, 365 yep. days a year. And it was a project that we developed it yep. during, uh, at least six, six months and something like this. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention it because it's, it's on based on the real data that, that is publishing REED, Red Electrica yep. de España. Uh, and not, this is the, we, we did it as a, still it's not a product. We, did, we have not sold it as a product, but uh, we have developed actually the prototype and even the application, mobile application. Okay, yeah, cheers for the comment. And maybe, yeah, we should talk offline Thank a little you. bit more. Any other comments? Um. Okay, thanks.